The last century has witnessed two clamitious world wars. The rise of communism, the introduction to nuclear warfare, terrorist attacks, and outbreaks of disease. From the third century until roughly the turn of the 20th century, Christianity was the religion of the Western world. Today, Western society discourages people from sharing their Christian beliefs, and some even claim that those who are Christian are closed-minded. In Egypt and other countries in the Middle East, thousands of Christians are being slaughtered and persecuted for claiming Jesus is Lord. Radical Muslims are attacking major cities and stilling fear throughout the rest of the world. There's a struggle of morality, such as abortion or redefining marriage, making the world look bleak and chaotic. Many Christians are wondering if we are nearing the end times. For these reasons, church leaders throughout America and the rest of the world have spoken to their congregation about the events described in Revelation because they believe that the end times are rapidly approaching. The book of Revelation is arguably one of the most important books in the Bible, and there are many methods of interpretation. There is much truth in Revelation, and as Christians, we should strive to unpack and understand the book and prepare from the end times. <clears throat> from these terrifying realities prevalent in society today, we need to immerse ourselves in the Bible, but we specifically need to take the time and interpret the prophetic book in the best manner possible. In this way, we can use our interpretation of Revelation as a means to understand the events occurring around us today. The focus of the thesis will be on Revelations chapter 4 through 19 because it creates the most controversy among interpreters. Beginning in chapter 4, John just illustrates the throne room or the spiritual realm. He goes on in chapter 5 and, discuss, and describes Jesus as the slain lamb and claims he's the only one who can open the book and which enclosed are the seven seals. Now the seven seals bring judgment and punishment onto the people of the earth. The seventh seal introduces seven trumpets, and again, uh, seven angels who each have a trumpet, and again, another series of great punishment and judgment for the people of the earth. After the seven trumpets, John describes visions of the Antichrist and Satan. And then he goes on to describe the last of the tribulation, the pouring of the seven bulls, which is the worst of the punishments for the people on the earth. After the tribulation period is the millennial period in which Christ rules over the church. Due to the language and descriptions of Revelation, there is a lot of controversy among interpreters. Four prevalent views arise from these controversies. That is the historicist, the preterist, the idealist, and the futurist approach. Now the historicists view the book of Revelation as a foretelling of events in history that begin in the time in John and will conclude at the second advent of Christ. The second hermeneutic approach, which shares a few similarities to the historicist approach, is the preterist approach, which believes that the majority of prophecies in Revelation have already been fulfilled. So the tribulation period and the reign of the Antichrist occurred around or by 70 AD, and from that point to the second advent of Christ is the millennial period. Now the idealist approach, which is the third hermeneutic view of Revelation, is differs from the historicist, preterist, and futurist approach because it does not try to find a specific fulfillment in the events in Revelation, but perceives Revelation as showing transcendent spiritual realities, such as enduring conflicts between the kingdom of God and sin, which is not linked to one specific event, but a continuing pattern of events throughout history. Now the final approach to eschatology, the study of the end times, is the, um, is the fourth one and the, historic, the futurist approach. Now, the futurist approach contends that the majority of prophecies of Revelation have not yet been fulfilled, but will be fulfilled in a future time. This approach also believes that the, from chapter 4 to the end of the book will be a short per time preceding the second advent of Christ. With that said, I will argue in this thesis that the futurist approach is the best hermeneutic view of Revelation 4 through 19 because it is consistent with the character of redemption in biblical narrative and offers a superior understanding of historical events than the others. First, it is important to understand the time period in which Revelation was written. Many, in the early church, specifically the second century, it was a commonly held view that Revelation was written during the reign of Domitian, which took place from 81 to 96 AD. Early church fathers, such as Irenaeus, believed that Revelation was written during the reign of Domitian because Revelation was unarguably written during a time of great persecution. Now, while there was great persecution during the reign of Nero, most of it was confined to the city of Rome, 
opposed to the persecution during Domitian's reign, which was prevalent and spread throughout the entire Roman Empire. Therefore, it would make sense that John was exiled to the island of Patmos where he wrote Revelation, which would date the book back to circa 96 AD. With an understanding of the time period in which Revelation was written, it is also important to understand one of the foundational arguments that separates the futures approach from the other three views, and that is the argument of the rapture. This is a foundational argument because unlike the other three views, before the tribulation period begins, Jesus will rapture his righteous people, the church, so they will not have to endure the suffering described in Revelation of the tribulation period. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, God delivered Noah and Lot from, their, from the, his wrath of destruction. In Genesis 6, 5 through 7, God looked at the world and was infuriated with the evil that was imminent on earth. So he decided to end mankind, but he saw favor in Noah and delivered him and his family from his wrath of judgment. In Genesis 19, God was enraged with the evil that infiltrated Sodom and Gomorrah. So he decided to pour his wrath on them, but he showed grace to Lot and saved him and his family from his judgment. God is consistent and he will continue to be consistent, even in the worst of his wrath, because as seen in the Old Testament, God delivers his righteous people from his wrath of judgment. Also in Revelation 4.3, John is taken up to heaven and sees 24 elders who were clothed in white robes and had gold crowns on their head. In Revelation 19, it says that the New Testament church will be clothed in arms and robes and made to sit together in heaven. What John saw in Revelation 4 were the 24 elders who represent the bride of Christ, the church. There is debate, however, whether these, church, these 24 elders represent the earthly church or angels. However, there is probable reason to believe that this was not angels, but the actual church. Angels neither rule nor sit on thrones. So how could those be the angels? In the Old Testament, there were 24 office sanctuary representatives of the Levitical priests' 24 courses. Just like in the, 20, just like in the Old Testament, so the, 24 courses, 20, so the 24 elders are representatives of the church. <clears throat> also, the word, to, that used el, el, the word described in elders in the original text was presbuteros, which is always used in scripture to describe men, not angels. Outside the context of Revelation, there is no question of the use of this word. So therefore, it would make sense to translate this word consistently with the rest of his biblical use. The church is mentioned more than 20 times in the first three chapters of Revelation, but not mentioned again until chapter 19. Now, during the tribulation period, some will convert to Christianity. Not all by any means, but some will. <clears throat> so it makes sense in Revelation 7, for example, that there is symbolic language that can refer to the church, but it is those who converted during the tribulation period. Since the future's position contends that the events in Revelation 4 through 22 are future events, this also means that the reign of the Antichrist must take place someplace, sometime in the future. Revelation 13, 2 says that the Antichrist will get his power from Satan, and all will be forced to worship him, and those who don't will be destroyed. He will kill without remorse. Emperors like Nero, Domitian, <clears throat> or Adolf Hitler will not compare to the wrath and destruction of the Antichrist. Daniel 8.25 says that he will get his power through deceit, and without warning, he will destroy many. This power will slither his way into society, and without the presence of the church, it will make his rise easier and less noticeable. <clears throat> the world will look bleak, and just as everything seems to be at its worst possible state, God will pour his wrath onto the people. <clears throat> Since the tribulation period has not yet occurred, it would also make sense the millennial period has not yet occurred, as a preterist view would believe. Christ reigns in the millennium, and it is clear that Christ has not reigned in the past couple millennium as, it, as incidents of corruption that would surely have not occurred otherwise, such as heresies or evil popes. The church is called to be one, but yet there are 40,000 denominations of the Christian church. The church will be united when Christ reigns in the millennium. At the same time, the historians have claimed that the papacy is the Antichrist. However, this can't be true because the nature of the Antichrist is to be against God. And while there have been corrupt popes and clergymen, the papacy as an institution is still striving to glorify God. Now the idealist approach. 
um, believes that Revelation is supposed to be interpreted allegorically. There is a time and place for this method of interpretation, however. For example, Dante's Inferno. Dante wrote a, is a poem of Dante experiencing sin and their punishments while traveling through hell. Dante uses symbolism, imagery, and allegories to convey his message to his audience. When Dante wrote Inferno, he was writing to the Florentines because he was exiled from his city due to political strife between the, Guelph and the Guelphs and Ghibellines. As he journeys through hell with the poet Virgil, he encounters distinct people from his present and past time within the circles of hell. There are certain punishments for each sin, and Dante strategically uses allegories and imagery to show how their punishment fits the crime. In contrast, Revelation isn't supposed to teach a lesson to Christians, but is merely informing Christians of the events to come. Similarly, in the book of Daniel, Daniel uses imagery and symbolism when describing the end times. Revelation is an elucidation of the end times and not a series of allegories and images. Revelation is a narration and is not, it's supposed to be a narration and not supposed to be a series of allegories and images. Revelation is a complicated and confusing book. And though there are many methods of interpretation, the futures approach is the best hermeneutic view of Revelation 4 through 19. It is crucial for us as Christians to continue to spread the word of God and to stand firm in our faith. Revelation 1 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed is the one who hears and keeps what is written in it. Though the events of Revelation 4 through 19 are disturbing and terrifying, we as Christians do not have to fear because God has prepared a room for his people so they will not have to endure through the suffering described in the tribulation period. It is now our duty as Christians to take the prophecy bestowed upon us and to continue to spread the word of God. Thank you.